So, uh, we have seen this happen many times in Pentecost assemblies in the past, that somebody would speak in an unknown tongue out loud, there would be no function, it would, it would fulfill no ministry, it would not be followed by interpretation, it would disturb and confuse and maybe frighten those that didn't know. This is a misuse of an unknown tongue. We have to bear in mind that in the public assembly, the primary aim to which everything else should be subjected is the edifying and blessing of our fellow believers. However, let's read also in 1 Corinthians 14.28 just to see that even here there is an alternative. Paul says, If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, not speak in an unknown tongue. Notice again, the church must mean the public assembly because if it meant the universal church, then we're always in the universal church. So, here is another case where, obviously, Paul has in mind the public assembly. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the public assembly and let him speak to himself and to God. All right, you feel you want to pray? You feel you want to pray in an unknown tongue? You're in the public assembly? It isn't going to be interpreted? What do you do? Very simple. Do it under your breath. Speak to yourself and to God. Now, I have known people baptized in the Holy Spirit for ten years who didn't know they could do it under their breath. So, you want to speak in tongues all the time? Do it all the time. Sit in the church, sit in the assembly, speak in an unknown tongue, but don't do it out loud. That's what Paul is saying. And I always mention this because I've discovered many believers baptized in the Holy Spirit that did not know they can do it under their breath. Then whom are they doing it to? To themselves and to God. But don't do it out loud in the public assembly if it isn't a ministry. If it doesn't minister to the body as a whole, it's out of place in the public assembly. Now let's look at the gift of interpretation, which we have defined as the ability to speak in a language understood by the speaker, the meaning of words previously given in an unknown tongue. Now, it is obvious that if this is the correct, interpreta correct definition of interpretation, then interpretation has relevance only to an occasion where an utterance has previously been given in an unknown tongue. If there has been no unknown tongue, then there can never be any logical or reasonable use for an interpretation. Without the unknown tongue, the interpretation has no significance and no purpose. And if you work through these nine gifts, I believe you'll find that all the other seven gifts are exemplified in the Old Testament. In various different parts of the Old Testament, you'll find examples of all the other seven gifts. But you'll find no example of the unknown tongue and no example of interpretation. Why? Because the unknown tongue and therefore interpretation stand in a special relationship to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and were never manifested or came into operation before the baptism of the Holy Spirit was experienced, which was on the day of Pentecost. So these two gifts, tongues and interpretation, stand in a special relationship to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and are never found amongst God's people before the time when the baptism was given, that is, from the day of Pentecost onwards. Now, Interpretation must not necessarily be understood to mean a word-for-word -word translation, but rather a rendering of the general sense. I don't know how many there are, if there are any here, that have preached to an interpreter in a foreign language. It's a very uh, useful experience. I have sometimes said that every person who's going to preach in his own language should be made to preach through an interpreter for at least six months before he's turned loose because it would trim an awful lot of preaching. You see, it's no good trying to make jokes, because they're usually impossible to translate. It's no good piling up a lot of bombastic words, because they just floor the interpreter and get you nowhere. It's no good using excessively slangy expressions, because they can't be translated. In other words, when you preach through an interpreter, all you can give is the meat, and all the frills just fall away. And I think if every preacher that preached in his own language had to start through an interpreter, we'd get a lot less wasted time in preaching. The only thing that will get through through an interpreter is something that's real, that has meaning, and that is helpful. Now, I've had the experience of preaching through interpreters in quite a number of different languages. And I've discovered that the interpreter makes a lot of difference. 
It's hard to preach something you believe effectively through someone who doesn't believe it. Their unbelief will largely shut it off. I've preached the Baptist and the Holy Spirit through a Baptist interpreter who didn't believe in the Baptist and the Holy Spirit. It was the hardest thing. It's like squeezing something through a channel that was too narrow for it. In fact, one time when I said baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he was speaking Swedish, which I understand they don't speak, he said filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, brother, that isn't what I said. I said baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I got him back to what I would said. I sometimes catch my interpreters because I can understand a good deal of what they say even if I can't speak it. And when they go wrong, I stop them. Because uh, my problem was with my wife, when we were in Denmark first, she began to interpret for me in the Danish. But having heard me preach many times before, she would get ahead of me. And well, she would say the thing I was going to say next. And I, if I hadn't known it, it wouldn't matter, you see. But when I, when I knew it, it paralyzed me. Because I had to think, now that was what I was going to say next. What was I going to say after that? So by mutual consent, we decided to drop that. <laughs> after that, I think I must tell you this story. It really is teaching, but it's there. After that, I decided I'd preach in Danish. And believe me, I've never learned Danish. I've just listened to interpreters so long that I thought by, I can do good enough to get by. And I got along all right. I've preached many times in Danish. But um, there was one time I was going to preach on people that get filled with the Holy Spirit and then leak out. And we just returned from Palestine at the time, where we always spoke Arabic. And uh, so I went to my wife before the sermon and I said, Now listen, I'm going to preach on this and I can't remember what the word is, so I don't know what the word is for leak. Would you tell me? So she told me. So I built up to this, which is the climax of my message, and gave it to them. And they looked at me and I looked at them. There was no communication, whatever. So I said it all over again very carefully and still no communication. Well, I thought, I can't go on. This is getting nowhere. So I closed the message and it was something of a flop. I went to my wife afterwards. I said, I wonder if you gave me the right word. You know, nobody seemed to understand it. She said, what word did I give you? I said, Basile. Oh, she said, that was Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> now, that really happened. I mean, uh, I'm not... So, <laughs> see, a good deal depends on the interpreter. Now, in other places, like in East Africa, I preached in English through a man who interpreted into Swahili, which is the sort of common language of East Africa. And I had two of the best interpreters in the country. But they were absolutely different. One would use at least twice as many words as the other. The other one was rather blunt and brief and to the point, but in some ways he got it across better. So this really brought home to me that interpreting is not exactly translating. It's conveying the meaning in a way that can be understood and all interpreters have an individual personality of their own. Now I believe all this is true about the gift of interpretation. It may be a literal word-for-word -word translation. There are occasions when a person has given an interpretation out of a language which he did not know, which was verified by someone present, as an accurate word-for-word -word translation. But I think you'll find, if you listen to people exercising the gift of interpretation, you'll find everybody has their own personality, which is still perceptible even when they exercise the gift. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, in the same time when I was speaking about, God showed me something about kinds of tongues, we had a meeting which was televised and uh, went on the main news uh, channel or the main news time on the one channel of TV in Auckland. And the man that televised it was not a Christian, but he was extremely interested in speaking in tongues. This was what he wanted to get. So we had a worship meeting, and the cameras were all there, and directional microphones, and we began to lead out, and there was a Baptist minister, and a Presbyterian, and an Anglican on the platform with me, and I spoke on the tongues, and then we, we did it. We worshipped God and praised him in tongues, and the whole thing, they gave it 20 minutes on the peak news time in Auckland. And uh, friends told me later that it was so popular that they repeated it later that year as the most interesting newscast of that particular period. But a group of fundamentalists in the city listened 
Ant said, ah, oh, there you are, you can see it wasn't real because even when Mr. Prince spoke in tongues you could recognize his voice and his accent. But you see, that's silly because in any case nothing will ever set aside my personality. It always remains, even in the operation of a gift. The same is true with interpretation. And you'll find, if you've heard many people give interpretation, everybody has his own particular style. Some people say, why is interpretation always given in King James English? I say, it isn't. It depends on the interpreter. One person will know King James English. It's got it, he's got it in his heart. It's part of his spirit. He'll naturally do it. Another doesn't. He'll do it in modern English. That isn't the important thing. So, let's understand that there are different kinds of interpreters. The gift operates according to the personality of the person through whom it operates. This is true about the prophets of the Old Testament. If you stop and think, you compare the utterances of Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah, who were more or less contemporaries. You couldn't mistake an utterance of Amos for an utterance of Isaiah. They're totally unlike. Or even Hosea. Yet they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit loves and delights in human personality. He never makes a human being a rubber stamp. He never sets aside human personality and uses a person like a robot or a machine. Now, an evil spirit will do that. And here's one great difference between the Spirit of God and satanic spirits. God created human personality. He esteems it. He appreciates it. He cultivates it. But the devil overrides it and tramples upon it. This is one of the ways that you can sometimes know whether it's the Spirit of God or another kind of spirit that's at work. If it's a spirit that enslaves and sets aside the normal human personality, it cannot be the Spirit of God. Now let's uh, consider some ways this gift operates. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 6, in verse 4, it says there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And in verse 6, it says there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. In other words, two men may have the same ministry, but it may operate very, very differently. For instance, to take two well-known examples which will not offend anybody, we have two men with an obvious ministry of an evangelist, Billy Graham and Oral Roberts. Each has the ministry of an evangelist, yet there is a very definite, conspicuous difference between the ministry of one and the ministry of the other. So though the ministry is the same, there are diversities of operations. The same is true with gifts. One person has a gift of healing, it operates one way. Another person has a gift of healing, which operates completely differently. Same gift, but a difference of operation. This is true also with the gift of interpretation. It does not operate in exactly the same way through each person. In your outline, I've suggested various different ways that I have actually experienced and found that this gift sometimes operates. For instance, one person may be given just an introductory phrase and launch out in faith. This is what usually happens to me. When I receive interpretation, I will receive the first sentence very clear and forceful in my mind. Now, if I were to say, Lord, if you'll give me the whole message, I'll speak it, I would never get it because you cannot set aside the principle of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everything that we do for God has to be done in faith. So God gives me the first sentence. If I begin to speak it out in faith and with authority, the rest will follow. But if I say, Lord, I'm not quite sure that anything else is going to come, and I'll look rather silly if I just speak out this sentence and hold it back, nothing more comes. Now, I think this is true of many people. I've talked to people and said, I think the Lord gave me interpretation, but I only got one sentence. Well, I said, you'll never get more till you start to use the one sentence you have. It's like people who say, I believe I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I only speak one word. When I say, go on speaking that word. Don't cut out with the one word. Be thankful for what you have and God will give you more. Use what you have and you'll get more. This is a principle with God in every field. And it's true with interpretation. I think the most common way that interpretation comes is an utterance is given in an unknown tongue 
And many times a person will say, after that I felt butterflies in my stomach, or I felt a sort of pressure, or I felt God wanted to do something, and then some words came in my mind. Sometimes it's a verse of scripture. Well, you will never give anything better than scripture, it's the highest. Give out that verse of scripture. And then you're launched, and after that things will follow that you didn't plan, you didn't conjure up, and sometimes you'll be very, very surprised at what you hear yourself saying. I remember an interpretation I gave that shocked me, and it still scares me when I think about it. It was in the meaning of the Full Gospel Business Fellowship Chicago chapter in Chicago. And it was an evening when they'd invited some of the newly filled, spirit, uh, newly spirit-baptized Roman Catholics to the meeting. And I was there just as an invited guest, and um, when they were going to start the real part of the meeting, they got me up to, uh, I don't know, say a word of introduction or something. And uh, so I got behind the microphone. Now it was a big room and uh, about four or five hundred people present in the meeting. And the Lord had me behind the microphone. I don't think he was interested in my words of introduction any more than I was, but he wanted me there for another purpose. When I got behind the microphone, a sister stood up and gave out a very clear authoritative utterance in an unknown tongue. There was no sort of bubbling and gushing. It was beautiful, clear, articulated. So I knew the interpretation was coming, and once more I knew it was coming through me. And so I began to speak, and I didn't know what I was going to say beyond the first sentence. And I'll tell you what I said, because it was scary. It was about the nearness of the Lord's return. And it's there's these two things I said, and I, they registered with me as I said them, and I, they didn't proceed from my mind at all. The first was, the natural mind of man has no way to calculate how close the return of the Lord is. The second was, there is no one here tonight who might not be alive when the Lord comes. Well, that was the one that shocked me. And I began to look around that congregation, and there was quite a number of people with gray hair. And I thought to myself, that's rather a, a tremendous statement to make. But you see, it did not, say who, did not say who would not be alive. It said who might not be alive when the Lord comes. Now, I believe that. I believe both those statements are true. I believe if we try to reason with the natural mind how close the coming of the Lord is, we will not be ready for it. And I believe it's very, very close. Those of you that have read that recent article in Look, on the Jesus movement amongst the hippies, you find out there's one thing they're all agreed on, Jesus is coming. And believe me, friends, they're right. And the theologians and the ministers and all the rest better wake up to the fact that God has spoken to those young people. Jesus is coming, and he's coming very, very, very soon. Incidentally, I'll also mention this as a verification of this gift. Over the last 10 or 15 years, I've been in many different continents, in different countries, amongst different groups of people, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some of them didn't know there were other groups anywhere in the world with this baptism. And in all these groups, at different times, I've heard utterances in tongues, followed by interpretation, which have told and warned the believers the coming of the Lord is very close at hand. This is not something that's been pressured into them by some particular teacher. It's not because they are associated with some particular group that holds this doctrine. It is the warning of the Holy Spirit. And there is in Revelation the statement, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And that's what's happening now. The Spirit is saying and the Bride is taking up the message. The Bride is the Church, but it originates with the Spirit, not with the Bride. And you find the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the true spiritual Church will have the same testimony wherever part of the world they're in. It's one Spirit moving in one body, preparing that body for the climax of this age. All right, let's look at some other ways in which a person might receive interpretation. I've heard all these actually testified to at one time or another. Another person may hear words or see them written on a scroll. I've met people that got it like this. Another person may be given a general thought which he clothes with words of his own choosing. That's different again, where God doesn't give the exact words, but he gives a series of inspired thoughts and leaves it to that person to, to express it in words that he has to choose. And then there's another in which a person may see a vision or a mental picture and then relate what he sees. 
About six or seven years ago, a Lutheran pastor came to me. He said, we've had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our Lutheran church. About 50 or 60 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the altar rails of the church. And he said, we are having the gifts of the Spirit in operation. And he said, uh, we have what we believe to be interpretation. But he said, we, we get it in a way that he said, I haven't met or haven't heard about elsewhere. He said, one person will speak in a tongue. And then he said, somebody else will get a kind of mental picture or a vision. And they'll start to describe what they've seen in this picture. And it seems to be the interpretation of the tongue. But he said, the funny thing is, all the people in my congregation get it that way. Why is that? Well, I said, there are things I can't explain, but I'll tell you one thing. People have faith for what they see happen. And according to your faith, Jesus said, be it unto you. If you believe you're going to get it one way, that is normally the way you'll get it. This is why it's so important to demonstrate things, because most people don't believe things till they see them. The moment people see it happen, they believe it will happen. For instance, the same with lengthening legs. A year ago, most people would never dream that somebody's leg would grow out visibly. Now, because so many people have seen it happen, they have faith for it to happen, and it happens. See? So the way we think, to a certain extent, and not totally, determines what we experience. If we believe it's going to happen that way, it will happen that way. Let's look at just a few other facts about this gift in the last few minutes. 1 Corinthians 14, 5 says this, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Notice the church is the assembled company of believers again. So Paul says, uh, speaking with tongues by itself is not so helpful to the church, not so edifying as prophesying, unless the speaking with a tongue is followed by an interpretation. In that case, apparently, a tongue of exhortation followed by interpretation, is equivalent to prophecy. It accomplishes the same purpose and it must obviously be judged by the same standards. In that case, that type of interpretation has to be judged just as prophecy would be judged. And it is obvious that a tongue of this kind does not contain merely a mystery addressed only to God because if it were a mystery that could not be understood, then it could not be interpreted. So it's obvious that whatever Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, about an unknown tongue communicating with God does not apply to a tongue that's followed by interpretation in the public assembly as he speaks of it in 1 Corinthians 14, 5. They are two different things. We have to keep them separate. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, 12 and 13, Paul goes on to say this, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying or building up of the church. This is the motive which should actuate all the gifts that we desire to edify the body of believers. So Paul says, if the tongue, when followed by interpretation, is more edifying, if you speak in an unknown tongue, pray that you may interpret. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now I have learnt by experience that if you can teach people this is God's will and cause them to act upon it, they will invariably receive interpretation. Let me give you Luke 11, 11 to 13. Keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 14. We're going back there in a moment. Notice what Jesus says in Luke 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is the father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? In other words, Jesus is saying, if you are a child of God, and you are prompted and stirred to ask for a certain gift of the Holy Spirit, you ask for it, you will get what you ask for. If you ask for bread, you will not get a stone. If you ask for an egg, you will not get a scorpion. So, you have that assurance, you've spoken in an unknown tongue, you desire to interpret, you pray for the interpretation, what do you do? The next thing you do is just interpret. How do you know you've got the right thing? Because you asked for the right thing and God guaranteed that if you asked for the right thing you'd never get the wrong thing. This is faith. Now I believe it's within the revealed will of God for God's people both to speak in tongues and to interpret. Let me show you this. 1 Corinthians 14, 5, Paul says, I would that ye all spake with tongues. Not some, but all. And in verse 13 and 14, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. As far as I'm concerned, those two scriptures 
put together indicate that it's within the revealed will of God for all believers to exercise both these gifts if they will. And then one final warning given in verses 27 and 28, tongues plus interpretation should not be overdone in any one meeting any more than prophecy should. No one meeting should be taken over and used exclusively for the operation of any particular gift. God has got a varied diet. He does not want a one-course meal on the table for his children.